I usually fold the pages over of my notes so that they're easy to flip, and I forgot to do that, so I'm doing that right now, very conspicuously, Lily. Yes, you didn't notice anything until I called you out. How's that? So, uh, yeah, whatever. Hey, good morning. If we haven't met, my name's Steve. It's good to see you all here today. We've got a lot of folks out of town. There's like a big, is it regional track meet today? Think, think this weekend? Regional? Sectional. State. States. It's like a big deal. Yeah. So we got some folks that are out there doing that. Um, anyway, it's good to see y'all. It is fall. Fall is like officially like, it's like settled in. You know, I was talking with a friend of mine uh, just this past week and uh, we were standing in his yard and looking around and we we're talking about the weather as guys do. And, uh, you know, it's really pretty this time of year with the leaves are changing color and all that, but it, things turn really quickly here where you can be, you know, it looks really great and pretty and wonderful, and then it can be like a week later, everything's just on the ground. Uh, maybe not everything, but it feels like everything. And uh, he said, yeah, all it takes is one good cold spell and, and, a, and a couple windy days, and there it is. And we're like in that today, so we'll see. Um, see we'll see how it goes, but... Anyway, we are in this series. It has nothing to do with fall weather, uh, but we're talking about the fruit of the Spirit, and it's called, uh, we've called it Cultivate because we feel like there's something that God invites us into, that there's a, um, there's a work that God wants to do in us through His Spirit. Um, we recognize that we also have a, a, a role in that work uh, that He wants to do. Uh, he invites us into it. And, uh, and so we have a part of like kind of getting our hands in the soil of our, of our hearts and, uh, and, and, and working it and, and responding to the things that God is doing. This is like week six in this series. It's kind of a longer one because we're going through each of the fruit of the Spirit. And uh, today we're talking uh, about goodness. And um, we have it up. Do we have that first? Do we have that passage? Yeah. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And um, so we're talking about goodness today. But I have a question for you. Uh, Not a proverbial question, but an actual question I like to hear. When we think of the word good, what are some things that come to mind? Or it, it could be things that are good. It could be just the idea of good. Innocent, okay. Safe. Hmm? Safe. Safe, yeah. What else? Hmm? Helping. Helping, yeah. Y'all have really good answers. I was thinking like puppies and food, good food, sunsets, but y'all are getting deep and I like it. This is great. Chocolate, Reese cups, they're good. You know, they're good. Pumpkins, are, Reese's pumpkins and eggs. And the trees. I'm super glad that they just did not limit it to Easter. You know, like that they expanded their horizons and got with the rest of the holidays, or a couple of them. Yes, thank you, Lord, for Reese cups. But yeah, so it's like these are some of the things that, that come to mind. We think of good. God is good, right? So we can go with that. It's no like negative points for that uh, that we didn't say that answer. But um, so when we think about scripture. And we think about the word good. How early on do we hear about something being good? Genesis, Genesis chapter 1. Does anybody know the verse? Four. It's verse 4. So it's like really early on that we hear about something being good. And, and this is what it says. This is, this is Genesis 1, 3 and 4. It says this. And it says, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good. And he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning. And that was the first day. Um, so this first, first part of Genesis, we see this wonderful uh, description. Uh, some even call it a poem of, of this imagery describing the creation of all things. Um, and God, along, each step along the way, he says, this is good. This is good. This is very good when he gets to the end of it all. 
The word that's being used here for good is, is tov. Um, it's the Hebrew word meaning good. It's not very like deep there, but it means good. Uh, tov, it is a deep and rich word that ought to draw us into a desire to know and to understand who God is better and to also understand who is it that he invites us to be? Who is it that he says we are? What is it that he has made? That is, that is kind of this idea of, of tov. Um, good. Goodness. Bless you. In our culture, there's a typical greeting and a response that we can have. I even heard it here this morning in various conversations. It seems to just kind of roll off the tongue. And we'll ask this question. is like, how's it going? Good. I'm good. Everything's good. We're good. We have this tendency to almost, I think, it can be easy for us. I don't think we do it on purpose. Uh, but to associate good with fine, okay. I'm in a reasonable mood today, you know? Like, like we, we, uh, but good is meant to be something deeper. You can still use that answer. I'm not, like, judging you right now. But, like, that's, that's, it's something that we do. Uh, but there's some, something that is meant to be deeper. Uh, now, so here's another sermon for another day. Uh, but I think that it's really, it is a good thing. I'm very aware of me saying the word good this morning. Uh, it is a good thing for us to be able to answer that question, I think, in an appropriate way, right? So if somebody says, how are you doing today? We feel weird when somebody's like, well, I'm, I feel like I got some seasonal depression going on, and my hip is kind of like hurting, and I think it's causing me to have some anxiety about the way that, like this week, because I got a lot of walking I've got to do, and I feel like I'm kind of falling apart. Like, if that was an answer, like... Most of us would be like, oh, okay. You know, like we don't know how to respond to that. Um, but I appreciate it when you do answer that, my question like that. So feel free to like let it, let it happen. Um, anyway, that's, like I said, that's another message for another day. Uh, but we're talking about good, goodness, tov. We read things like here in Genesis, right in the beginning, light is good. The land is good. Water is good. Birds are good. Animals are good. People are good. Very good. Very good. Like, that's how it ends. With the, like, he creates us, and he's like, ah, oh, nailed it. Like, it's just like very good. Now, here's where I think we, things can get, it, makes, it gets you like a little, like, makes you think a little bit here. Um, we get the sense that goodness and people and mankind, it, that goodness, it, it runs out kind of quick when you read the story. It seems like it doesn't last that long. So here's a question. When we think about Scripture and where it says, who is good, other than this Genesis 1 bit, who is good in Scripture? God, Okay. Okay, we'll, we'll give you that. Yeah, God, Jesus is good. What about everybody else? Are we good? Filthy rags. Hmm? Filthy rags. Filthy rags. Like oily rags in a bucket in your shop. Romans 3.12. Does this come to anybody's mind? Maybe not the reference, but the verse. It says there is, we have it up here. It says this. These are, these are intense words coming from Paul. It says this. It says there is no one righteous not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good. Not even one. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. So how do we, like, what does this mean? If we, uh, like, so, you know, you read through the Genesis story and you see that there's just, like, brokenness kind of comes in. Uh, and that brokenness, uh, it gets passed on and on, and we step into a broken world, and we are products of a broken world. If you are a parent, you are a broken person raising broken people. We see this in our, in our world. And if we, if, if we read this, and we just take this just for this, now I don't, I'm not just cherry-picking this. Like I think Scripture talks a lot more about us, and we're going to get to that here this morning, so don't, 
don't freak out and run out and just go crazy. But like, if this is what scripture says, how do we reconcile this? If we read stuff like here in the fruit of the spirit that we're called to be good, that goodness is something that we can have in our own lives. What do we, what do, we do with that? Um, I think that there is something in our theology, which is our understanding of who God is, uh, that puts up a huge barrier between us. Like God is good and we are not, and we have to deal with that somehow. We're called to live out a, a, a life that is good, a good life. What does that look like? How do we do that? How can we do that if we're not good, if we just were to use this passage here in Romans 3? Something to think about. So as you might hear, watch the show. There's a, there's a show that was on. It's called The Good Place. Yeah. Yes. The grad and working group watched that group. Okay. Anybody else? Yes? Okay. So a few of us. Um, so this show, it's it's. It's a pretty funny show, right? Like, it, it's a good, it's, I think it's pretty funny. It was only four seasons long. If you haven't watched it, that's okay. I'm about to tell you what it's about right now. Um, it's still funny if you want to go back and watch it later. But the premise is that there are these four individuals who wake up in like a waiting room. And the first thing they see is everything's fine. Um, and they meet this guy named Michael, who's played by Ted Danson from Cheers, if you remember that show. Uh, and um, it turns out, uh, and, and they wake up into what he calls the good place. It's supposed to be heaven. They don't use that word heaven that much in the show, but it's supposed to be what it is. Um, and they think that they're there because they lived a good life, and everything is the way that they want it. Uh, it is an unlimited supply of frozen yogurt with all the toppings you could imagine, and they get to fly. It's like all these, it's, it's a pretty comical thing. Now, it turns out that they were not good people. We kind of learn their stories as as the show goes on. Um, And it also turns out that they're not in the good place. They're actually in the bad place that is meant to look like the good place. And they are, it is designed and set up so that they are to torture each other for eternity. Under this facade of like, everything's great. Everything's fine. Um... But they figure it out. Eleanor, the kind of the main person in the show, she, she picks up on it. She's like, wait a second. This is not the good place. This is the bad place. Because why would we be getting on each other's nerves in the good place? Why would we be angry at each other or frustrated? This isn't what the good place should be like. And everything gets revealed that they're actually in the bad place. And they get, things get rebooted like 800 sometimes. Um, and, and, and now, okay, so I have some deep theological issues with this. I just want to make it very clear that I, there's no sense of like, yes, this is what Scripture talks about. This is how the Bible wants us to look at things and live our lives. Uh, no, that is not it. I'm trying to give an example of how I think it can actually be easy for us to maybe think that sometimes it works like this. Because here's how you either get to the good place or the bad place from the show's perspective. It works like this. I do good things, I get points, right? Uh, If I do bad things, I I lose points. As you can imagine, the more points that you have, the better you are, and the more likely you are to go to the good place. It just kind of seems like it makes sense, you know, in a lot of ways. But they realize, like, things get complicated, like, you might choose one thing, but it has, you know, 18 other um, unanticipated consequences that you weren't expecting, like um, with, you know, you, you go and you buy this one type of clothing, like, yeah, well, but these gophers had to die so that this fabric could be harvested and all that. It's, you know, it just gets really weird. Now, the sh- in the show, they don't get, they don't talk about Jesus. They don't talk about grace. They don't talk about mercy. They don't talk about the cross. It's, there's none of that. It's just focused on ethics uh, and morality. Now, even with us having some sort of baseline understanding of God's grace, um, of Jesus being the good news, uh, of mercy, of faithfulness, all of these things, even if we have some understanding of these things, there's a question. Isn't it 
easy for us to think things like, if I do good things, I'll, I'll be good, and maybe God will like me better. We can do that. I think that is a tendency that we can have. If I do good things, doesn't that make me a good person? Going back to this thought from a few minutes ago, doing th- good things can make me a good person, and so then I, I'm living a good life. Living a good life sounds like something that we want, right? This gets really murky really quick when we, if we take this and we, and we go with it too much. And I think this is where we have to take a moment and really check ourselves, kind of look at ourselves. Um, with, when it comes to a good life, you know, we're not, we're not talking about a good life in the sense of having everything that we want, like you would see in The Good Place in this show. Um, but a good life in that our lives represent somehow the character of God. And people, the people around us, they can see God in us. This, this is what it means to be Christ-like. This is what the fruit of the Spirit is for, to see Christ's character being built up in us, that we become more like him. This type of goodness we cannot do on our own. We need the Holy Spirit, which is what this whole series has really been, around, been about. Uh, there's this book uh, called, uh, I'm, I've been working through it, it's called uh, A Church Called Tove. It's about goodness. And it's about uh, the first half of the book looks at our, our, our culture and even the culture that we see in the church and how jacked up things can get and how jacked up things are and can be. Uh, the second half talks about how to reconcile that. How is it that we can see good? How is it that we can work towards seeing uh, Tove be, being brought about in our world? But it's written by Scott McKnight and Laura Beringer. And uh, Scott McKnight, we, a bunch of us here in LCF years ago read the book called The Jesus Creed. That's the same, same guy that, that wrote that book. Um, but they say this in the book, says this, says, goodness is one of the manifestations of the Holy Spirit's presence in our lives. When there's goodness in our lives, that is the work of the Holy Spirit being made manifest in us. I think it is really important for us to allow goodness uh, to be put in its place, to be put in its right place. Just earlier today, uh, Jess was reading from Psalm 23. It says, surely your goodness, your tov, and love will follow me all the days of my life. Goodness is the Lord's, and he desires to instill that in us through his spirit. We talked about the creation story. Everything was created and it was declared good or tov. Uh, There's a a great description of tov or of goodness that I want to read from you from this book. Um, And we have it up here on the screen so you can follow along. But it says this. Remember, tov is goodness. Tov is God's design for all creation. He shapes everything for goodness. His turning of the formless and empty into created order gave everything he created a design, a purpose, a function. Tov is God's artistic evaluation of all he did. In other words, perfect, excellent, just as I wanted, nailed it, like we said earlier. Put differently, Tov is about beauty, aesthetics, excellent. And what pleases our senses of sight and of sound. He gives some examples. Some of you might relate to one or more of these things. Like a well-played piano. A coordinated golf swing. The right... This hit a nerve there. I got it. Um, <laughs> the right word for the right situation. A European cathedral that stands above all structures and beckons us to come and pray and worship. A beautifully, this might suit some, I know some of you, a beautifully arranged dining room. A well-organized event. Oh, I'm getting wonky here. Or it could be this, a jolly beagle following its nose across the lawn. 
all Tove. Tove suggests what is visually pleasing and pleasant. What is desirable, can I get that handheld microphone, please? Because I think this is, oh, she's getting it. Um, what is desirable? What is So this is a good description of what Tove is, what Tove looks like. So remember that there's these two kind of, two levels of it. There's, um, Tove is about uh, what is perfect, what is excellent, just the way that God had designed things. And then, uh, but there's also, he, he says, put, they say, put it differently, it's about beauty, aesthetics, excellent, and what pleases our senses of sight and of sound. And so it is that deep inner stuff that God does, that God has done, that God will do. But it is also that stuff that just catches our eye at first. They go on to help us see that Tov isn't something to just to witness or to observe, but they explain that it is meant to be lived out. And so they, they, they write this, a Tov character is formed by spirit-filled behavior. And those who have Tove character will behave in Tove ways. In other words, Tove is active. Now, lucky for us, as I said before, we can't do this on our own, which you might be thinking, why am I so lucky that I can't do this thing that you're talking about? Well, it's okay, because Christ has done a good work. And he continues to do that good work in you and through you. It is Christ that makes us toad. We are transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit because we can't. The reason why is because we can't muster up enough of this sort of power and effort on our own. Romans 15, we read this. Uh, this is 14 in 15, uh, verse 14. It says, I myself, it's Paul writing, I myself am convinced my brothers and sisters, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with knowledge, and competent to instruct one another. This is the same book that we just read, him quoting, that there is no one that is good. There is a reconciliation process that happens through the work of the Spirit in you, in us, collectively as a church and also personally as individuals. He's writing, this letter that he's written of Romans is written to a bunch of Gentiles, people that were not born into the family of God, who would be very easy to be like, well, yeah, they're, they're good. God, God chose them, like as his people a really long time ago, right? Like this, they're good. Like they've, they've, they've got a good seat at the table. We realize that there's more that God is doing in their midst and in our midst as well. Uh, and just a few verses down, uh, Paul writes that it is the work of the Holy Spirit that makes us, uh, that makes them and us sanctified. That word sanctified means set apart, holy, in essence, tove. Ephesians 2, uh, verses 8 through 10, it says this, it says, for it is by God's grace, this is, this is why it's important, God's grace that you have been saved through faith. And it is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So it's not like this point system that we talked about, where you do the good things, and then that makes you a good person. It is Christ at work in us that causes us to be good, and then out of that, we are meant to do good. We can't fake it. Um, sometimes we get fed up with doing good. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but I, I'm certain that at times you're like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to be a good person right now. I don't want to help right now. I don't want to be generous right now. Our heart just isn't in it sometimes. Maybe it's for a specific person. Maybe it's for a specific circumstance. Every time we walk into our job, we're like, I'm just here. I'm going to do the thing, and I'm going to walk out. 
I don't care what anybody thinks. I'm going to do my job, go home. Because when I go home, I'm happier. Here's one more passage uh, for the road. And I think it's a doozy if we take time to really focus in on what the Apostle Paul is saying here. This is from Galatians chapter 6, verses, uh, starting in verse 7. It says, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, and I like the way that he says this, therefore, as we have opportunity, because opportunities come up, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. It seems like there's some sort of partnership, some sort of relationship that God wants us to have, uh, that God wants to have with us when it comes to all this, really um, for all of these fruit of the Spirit. Um, we do this with the Spirit, hand in hand with God. When it comes to goodness, if, if, if uh, like they write, if, if Tov is active, if, if goodness is active, if good is an active, meant to be an active thing, what are some ways for us to engage in this? I think that there are two. Well, there's a lot more than two. Actually, the whole half of this book really gets into it. I recommend this book. Just go for it. It's called A Church Called Tov. Yeah. Um, but there's um, but at least two that really come to mind. Uh, one uh, is service, and the other is generosity. Uh, these don't take, uh, you don't have to really search far to be able to engage in any one, either one of these. Um, they can be easy to do at times. They can be more challenging to do at times. Um, with service, um, really it comes down to uh, taking time to do something for somebody else. If you look for opportunities to serve someone or some people, if you look for these opportunities, God will surely give you opportunities. Remember, as opportunities come. Uh, it doesn't always have to be a huge thing. Uh, sometimes it can be as small as opening a door for somebody, right? We've seen this. Uh, maybe it means that we go and we volunteer somewhere. Um, but we do this um, by having an open hand and offering it to God as we go. That is what discipleship is. It is God with us, that we are engaging with God and doing the things that he invites us into and walking with him as we go. The second thing uh, is generosity. And really, this also actually touches back on service, but um, generosity is really uh, it is giving freely to someone. Um, there's kind of three things that really settle in for this. Um, there's time, money, and resources. These are, these are ways that um, we can be generous. Um, time, which leads back to service. Um, money, you know, it could be that we, we want to give to something that uh, God is doing. Uh, it, could be, it could be here through the church. Uh, it could be through, you know, some of the organizations that are here. Uh, it could be Lots of things. There's lots of things out there to give give money towards, uh, and then resources, uh, baking some, making somebody dinner, you know, like lasagna. That's a resource. Go make some, make it for somebody. You know, uh, if somebody needs to borrow a car, being generous, freely giving. Um, if somebody you know needs your lawnmower, you know, the, the list goes on and on and on. Um, but service and generosity. I think that these are two. Uh, sort of gateway ways for us to step into understanding and engaging with the goodness that God has for us. Uh, for us to receive, sure, but also for us to um, put back into the, our culture. Because, you know, that's what, that's what we want to see. We want to see uh, our world experience God's goodness. And to do that, God invites his people to be a part of that, and that's, that's us. So we need to remember that doing these things, it isn't about getting more points like in a good place. Instead, it's about taking strides to be more like Christ, opening ourselves up to the Holy Spirit, 
uh, and to the Holy Spirit's work through us and in us. Uh, when we genuinely try, I believe this. Like when we genuinely try to engage with the fruits of the Spirit, with these fruits of the Spirit, and we can submit ourselves to the Spirit, which is kind of like a key part in the midst of this, um, that we will be just a little bit more like Christ, and that's certainly a good thing. So let's take a moment and pray. Uh, God, we thank you for uh, this morning. Uh, God, we thank you that you are good. And that uh, out of your goodness, uh, you created all things good or very good. And um, you still say today, uh, much time, a lot of time later, uh, that, that, that things are good, that people are good, that you have put your spirit in us and we can see uh, your goodness, that we can experience your goodness. I pray for moments, for opportunities that we can um, see your presence in our lives, that we can see your spirit uh, manifest in us so that we might be able to uh, experience your goodness, that we would see your goodness, uh, but also help others to do that as well by way of what you do through us. We love you, Jesus, and we thank you for this time that we can come and worship uh, and hear from your word. We thank you for uh, this space that we can uh, be present with you and with one another. We love you. We pray this in your name. Amen.